it's 12.01. Um, I see a few more people have joined. So why don't we get started? Uh, everybody, thank you for joining us today. You are um, on a, a webinar for Gays with Kids. And we're going to be going over surrogacy and IVF for queer men. So again, joining me, I'm the founder of Gays with Kids. Joining me, uh, I've got Vicki Ferrara, who's the founder and president of Worldwide Surrogacy Specialists, along with Dr. Guy Ringler, who's a partner of California Fertility Partners. I'll be sharing a little bit more about them, uh, and then they'll be talking as well, so you'll be able to hear from them in just a moment. Uh, actually, before I go into the agenda, if anyone has any questions, please feel free to use either the Q&A function or the chat function, and I'll be happy to, to address your questions. Um, we will. We have left plenty of time at the end of the webinar for your questions, and we've actually already received some in advance of the webinar. So today's agenda is very simple. We wanna go over and make sure that you all understand fully what surrogacy is and, and IVF, um, the role of your fertility clinic and your surrogacy agency, which are the two primary family building partners you'll be working with in a surrogacy and IVF journey and how to get started and how Gays with Kids can help. Quick background on, on Gays with Kids. We've been around now for seven years. Uh, last fall, we launched a new program where we're, where we, which we call Gays with Kids Becoming, which is really to help you all become dads and, you know, and to, that supplements our current content focused on sharing stories. We now actually help you choose which path to parenthood makes the most sense to you. Uh, and once you've chosen that path, we want to work with you by helping you through each step of your journey. And at the end of that is, of course, who are the family building partners you should work with? And so we can also do that through our family building uh, partners program. We call them our partners to fatherhood. Both Dr. Ringler and Vicki Ferrara are part of that program. All right, so some very quick facts about surrogacy and IVF before I hand things over. These are questions I know that we get asked most frequently. Uh, and I want to make, we thought we'd bring the, these to the beginning so that they're not on your brains anymore and you're able to sit and really take in what Vicki and Dr. Ringla have to say. Yes, the time to complete a surrogacy journey is about 18 to 24 months. A little shorter, some people a little bit more. Again, our experts will talk more about that and give details. The average cost, there is a range between 135,000 and 200,000, has to do with multiple factors. And again, I'm going to let these folks talk more about this. What I do want to tell you is that to any surrogacy and IVF journey, absolutely takes a village. A team of family building professionals will help guide you on your journey every step of the way. And what I like to say is there are, there are two things that I look at that I, so I've become a dad both through uh, surrogacy and IVF as well as adoption. And what I've learned is it doesn't matter what your path to parenthood is. There are two qualities that you need to find in your family building partners. One is of course, expertise. Now I don't just mean in this case, expertise with surrogacy and IVF, but more specifically expertise working with queer men to help them through this path through surrogacy and IVF. The second thing that's just as important as this is expertise is passion. And uh, you know, specifically working with people who are just as passionate as I am, helping gay, bi, and trans men become dads through their, their path to parenthood. And I will tell you that both Vicki of Worldwide surrogacy specialists and Dr. Ringler of California Fertility Partners are well-regarded experts in the industry, but on top of that, they're just as passionate as I am for helping each of you become dads through surrogacy and IVF. And so again, whether you work with them or anyone else, I just want to, can't emphasize enough that you find people that you consider, that you know are truly experts in their fields, working with queer men, and are really passionate about helping you become dads. So without further ado, I'd like to hand things over to Dr. Ringler. Uh, he'll talk more about sort of your work with an IVF clinic and the journey that you'll undertake. So thank you very much, Dr. Ringler. Uh, actually, thank you both Vicki and Dr. Ringler for joining us. Appreciate it. 
Uh, I know that uh, everyone's in for a really informative session. So without further ado, take it away, please. Thank you, Brian, and, and uh, welcome everyone. I'm very happy to be here. I've been helping gay men to have babies for almost 25 years now. It's hard to believe it's been that long, but um, our, our program was responsible for helping to create some of the first um, gay families through egg donation and surrogacy. And I've always felt passion about um, helping gay men because I'm a gay man and I, I feel compassionate about helping others who want to have a family to build a family by applying all of the principles that we've learned through assisted reproduction. Um, so in this process, just as an overview, we're using high quality eggs that are produced by a young egg donor to create the embryos. We're culturing these embryos to the well-advanced stage. Sometimes we'll do genetic testing and we're putting these high quality embryos into the perfect environment that the gestational surrogate provides us. So this results in a very high chance of pregnancy um, for individuals pursuing this path. So let's walk you through the details of the process. Um, I often hear that men get overwhelmed by all the logistics of the process, but on the medical side, it's really quite simple. And I've broken it down into five equal, five steps of the process. So step number one is to test your sperm. Um, Cause most men, haven't had their sperm checked because they've never had to. Um, a semen analysis is a basic test that tells us information on the qu quantity and quality of your sperm. And we want to know if it's good enough for the process, if you would benefit from any treatment before the process to try to improve the sperm quality. Um, so baseline semen analysis is, is the first step. If you do it in our laboratory and the sample looks good, we'll go ahead and freeze it because for most men, we'll use thawed frozen sperm to inseminate the eggs of the egg donor when uh, she comes through. The only men that I ask for fresh sperm on are men with very low sperm numbers, but that's probably less than 5% of the population. So a semen analysis and we will probably freeze it. On the day that we freeze the sperm, we always do the government required FDA infectious disease screening. And then that sample is covered for use in the treatment process. We also do genetic carrier screening to check for mutations for recessive genetic diseases. It's recommended that all individuals, men and women who are planning to start a family have genetic carrier screening to help minimize the risk of genetic disease in the children. So you will be tested, your egg donor will be tested um, just to make sure that you don't share a mutation. And you're, you're gonna wanna know your genetic carrier testing results before you make final selection of the egg donor. Because if you know you have a mutation for disease like cystic fibrosis, for example, you cannot select an egg donor with mutation for cystic fibrosis. So that's important information to know. Um, step two is to select your egg donor. And about, out of all the steps, this is one of the most important because not only would that individual provide the genes for your children, but her egg quality has a large impact on the overall success rates. So in our program, we work with many different egg donor agencies to give our patients a wide variety of candidates to choose from. So you should think about what characteristics are most important to you, family heritage, educational level, appearance, interests, and you should search until you find that individual that you feel uh, excited about and uh, uh, most comfortable with. You have the option of meeting the donor and getting to know her or being entirely anonymous. It's, or some of my patients do something in between where they have a Zoom call and just have a casual conversation, uh, but they don't exchange contact information. So take your time, find the donor that you feel really good about. Once you select your donor, she will go undergo complete screening before the treatment is started. So she will have psychological screening, genetic carrier screening like you did. She will have an interview with a geneticist to go through the family tree looking for histories of disease in, in the family. She will have uh, infectious disease screening, urine drug screening, and importantly, she will have ovarian reserve testing. So what, is, what does this mean? We wanna make sure that she's going to make a sufficient number of eggs um, 
to give us a good outcome in the process. So um, the amount of eggs, the number of eggs a woman produces per cycle can vary even amongst young women. So our goal is to retrieve at least 20 eggs. Um, between 15 and 25 is an excellent number. Um, some individuals will make 30 eggs. Another woman of the same age may make 12. Um, by producing more eggs, it gives us more embryos for the process. Once she completes her medical screening, um, she signs contracts, and then we can go to step three to create embryos for freezing. Now, five to 10 years ago, we would never start creating embryos until we had a surrogate available to allow for a fresh embryo transfer into the surrogate mother. Today, in most high quality IVF labs, pregnancy rates with frozen embryos are the same, if not better than fresh embryos. So today the standard of care has become to create embryos, freeze them, and to do a frozen embryo transfer into the surrogate at a, a later point. So today we create embryos, freeze them, and then we go on to the, the sur surrogacy side of the process. In the embryo creation process, the egg donor undergoes ovarian stimulation, just like women who are undergoing IVF treatment for infertility. Beginning in the second day of the menstrual cycle, approximately, she will start daily injections of hormones, and those hormones stimulate the development of all the eggs that she's recruited for that month. So if she's recruited 10 eggs, we can develop those 10 eggs. If she's recruited 30 eggs, we'll, we'll develop those 30 eggs. She's monitored carefully over the course of nine to 12 days so that we can determine the best time to remove the eggs. And the monitoring is very important. If you remove the eggs too early, the eggs will be immature and they can't fertilize. If you remove them too late, you can potentially decrease their quality and pregnancy potential. Um, once we determine that the eggs are ready for retrieval, we schedule the surgery. It's a, about a 20 minute procedure done under IV sedation. The day that the eggs are retrieved, we'll either obtain a fresh sample for the intended parents or more often we'll thaw one vial of frozen sperm from each intended parent and then inseminate the eggs. The next day, the day after egg retrieval is day one of embryo culture. We look for signs of fertilization and we typically see about 75% of the mature eggs will fertilize. Um, so on day one of culture, it's a fertilized egg or one cell embryo. The next phase in IVF is we're gonna keep those embryos in culture over the course of six days to watch them grow and develop. And in our laboratory, we keep them undisturbed until day five. Between days one and days five to day six, we expect about 60, sometimes 70% of those one cell embryos to develop into a hundred cell embryo called a blastocyst. And the, the blastocyst is the developmental stage an embryo must reach if it's going to have the chance to implant to start a pregnancy. A blastocyst has an outer layer of cells called the trophectoderm that will become the future placenta. And on the inside of the blastocyst is a cluster of cells, we call it the inner cell mass, and those are the future fetal cells. So once it becomes a blastocyst, and some will on day five, some on day six of culture, we can freeze it directly for transfer at a later date, or oftentimes we'll biopsy it for genetic testing. Now this is called pre-implantation genetic testing, or PGT. In this procedure, the embryologists are removing four to eight cells from the outer layer of this 100 cell sphere of cells, they then freeze the embryo, the cells go to the genetics lab, and the test result is gonna tell us whether or not that embryo has the correct number of chromosomes. So we all have 46 chromosomes, so a, a, a normal healthy embryo should have 46 chromosomes. Some of these eggs, even from a healthy young egg donor, we know are going to um, have an abnormal number of chromosomes, resulting in embryo that does not have the correct number. It can look like a beautiful, well-developed blastocyst, yet be genetically abnormal. So what we find in a 25-year-old egg donor population from these PGT results is about 30 to 40% of the embryos will be abnormal, 60 to 70% normal. So we still have a high percentage of normal embryos, but there are some abnormals. 
So the PGT will screen out things like Down syndrome. It does tell you the gender. So you're gonna find out how many normal male embryos, how many normal female embryos you have in that group of embryos. Now that we have our embryos created and frozen, at this point is when the surrogacy agencies usually match you with the surrogate mother. And they, were, they will present you several candidates. And once that match has been made between you and the surrogate mother, the surrogate mother comes to me to, to undergo a medical evaluation. So before I see her in person, I will have reviewed all of her prior pregnancy records um, to make sure they were normal, uncomplicated. Um, and then she will come to me in person for a physical exam, a uterine evaluation, infectious disease screening, urine drug screening, to make sure that she's gonna be this optimal candidate for the process. And usually by the time that she gets to me, um, she's been very well screened by the agencies, um, by our pre-screening. So most surrogates, not all, but most will pass the medical part of the process. Um, and what I'm looking for in a surrogate mother is a woman with completely normal past pregnancies, um, women with in, in overall good general health, and um, women with a happy, stable home life. Any pregnancy can be stressful, whether it's for themselves or, or as a surrogate mother. So we wanna make sure they have a good support system. Um, and in general, I have to tell you, these surrogates are amazing women who are really dedicating a year of their lives to help you become parents like they are. So they're, they're, they're doing this for that one day when they can hand over the baby and say, congratulations, dad. So they're really amazing women. Once they've passed the medical screening, the lawyers will complete the contracts. And so once they give us that legal clearance at that point, we'll plan their embryo transfer. For the surrogate mother, her treatment is a little bit simpler than for the egg donation. Um, I give her hormones in amounts that mimic the hormonal changes of a natural cycle. So that's two weeks of estrogen to thicken the uterine lining. And then I add in progesterone to make that thickened lining receptive to, to embryo implantation. And there's a very narrow window in the, in the menstrual cycle referred to as the window of implantation when the uterine lining will be receptive to embryo attachment. So on that day, we're gonna thaw and transfer one or two embryos, depending on the desires of the attending parents. Most transfers today are single embryo transfer to avoid uh, a twin pregnancy, which is a high-risk pregnancy. Um, some of my patients do want twins, so if, we're, if they're hoping to have twins, then we're gonna take extra special care in selecting our surrogate as someone who we think will be a good candidate for a twin pregnancy and who will present minimal risk of some of the complications that we see in a twin pregnancy. So the pregnancy rates in this process, again, are very high because we're taking these high quality eggs from the egg donor, we're culturing them to, and developing them to the blastocyst stage. Oftentimes we're doing genetic screening, the screening out those that we know are abnormal. And we're putting this high quality genetically normal embryo into, into this perfect environment that the surrogate provides us. The surrogate is a woman with no history of infertility. She has proven fertility. So that uh, provides us this very high pregnancy rates and a very good chance of your, your becoming dads on the first try. Ideally, we like to have extra embryos um, in addition to the one transferred, of course, in case we need it to achieve a pregnancy um, or for a, a second baby in the future. Generally, what we'll find in an egg donor cycle after the genetic testing, we'll end up with somewhere between four and eight genetically normal embryos. So we have several attempts at a pregnancy and extra embryos for the future. And those embryos can be stored for decades um, without any detriment to the embryos themselves. So um, select your egg donor wisely, find someone that you really like, ask your doctor, um, if he or she thinks she's gonna be a good candidate. Uh, most importantly, is she gonna make enough embryos to achieve a pregnancy and maybe have some extras if you need them? So this is what we do on the medical side um, to help you become dads through egg donation surrogacy. It's a great process. Um, I've, I have a wonderful team 
of professionals in, in my program to help you through the process, wonderful nurses, we have a new IVF lab we built four years ago with all state-of-the-art equipment and they're making more beautiful embryos today than I've ever seen. Um, we have senior level embryologists and we'll all, we all work very hard to maximize your chance of becoming a dad. Awesome, thank you so much, Dr. Ringler. That was definitely a thorough background and understanding of uh, all the work that's involved from working with an IVF clinic during this journey, so thank you. You're welcome. All right, Vicki, why don't you take up next and talk about uh, surrogacy agency and how you guys work with, with uh, our intended dads. Thanks, Brian, and thank you, Dr. Ringler. It's a pleasure to be with you both on this uh, webinar. and. Um, Dr. Ringler and I do have patients, clients together, and it's always a pleasure to work with your clinic. The patients are always happy and very successful journeys. So I am Vicki Ferrara. I own and operate a surrogacy agency called Worldwide Surrogacy. I'm a lawyer. I've been practicing for over 30 years. I'm gay. I have a partner and two children, and that is really how I got into surrogacy was by being an out uh, gay lawyer for many years. And then people started to ask me if I could help them find a surrogate. So I, I started the agency approximately 15 years ago. And right now we have about 90 to 100 babies every year. And we have a, a full team of people to help our parents along their journeys and to support our surrogates. We have not had any layoffs or furloughs as a result of the pandemic, and things are actually ramping up back to normal now. So, and you're doing the right thing by being on this webinar. Um, that is a first step is to gather information and to hear information firsthand from the professionals working in this field. You can read a lot on the internet, but it's not always accurate. So this is a good first step. And then you can even break it down further by having individual consultations with us when you're ready to do that. So uh, first of all, um, a comprehensive surrogacy agency is basically a group of people that will be there for you through your entire surrogacy journey. From the time that you are inquiring about um, the agency and how much things cost and how operations go to when you have you, your baby and you have a birth certificate with your name or two names of the parents on it. And the, I like to describe um, the three phases of the journey. The first is the matching phase. And we can look at this slide for a second. You can see it says at the top matching with screen, well-supported and amazing surrogates. Um, the second part matching you with a carefully selected egg donor. That's not something I do. My agency focuses on uh, surrogates, but we do support the selection of an egg donor by assisting, as Dr. Ringler said he does and their clinic does, by uh, offering very, very good and reputable resources to select an egg donor. Uh, many of my intended parents find their egg donor at the medical clinic through the egg donors that are um, coming to egg donation through the, clinic, the clinic's program. But if not found through the clinic, there are other resources, very good uh, egg donation agencies that we can connect with. And it doesn't actually make things more complicated. It's actually still very simple. All that you need to do is select the egg donor. The professional teams uh, jump in and handle all of the paperwork and the exchange and the need to get the egg donor to the clinic. So basically selection and the rest will fall into place. In terms of what we do in, in recruiting and screening surrogates, this is really, really important. Um, so whatever surrogacy agency you look into, you wanna make sure that they have very rigorous screening of the surrogates and that they connect really well with the medical clinics, that the medical uh, screening is very rigorous as well, because that sets the stage for a very smooth, successful journey. So basically here at Worldwide, the women who apply preliminarily have to have children, the births had to be healthy, they have to be within a certain range of weight and age, they have to live in a surrogacy favorable state, they cannot be on welfare, they cannot be on any kind of medication that's counter to a, a healthy pregnancy, 
and any questions like that, we defer to the medical team for answers. If they meet the preliminary criteria, then they go into the more full rigorous screening, which includes a full psychological evaluation. If she's married, her husband goes through this, a full background investigation. We have these done by outside parties and outside licensed clinical psychologists and outside private investigation firm. We have a home check done. We have actually the private investigator do the home check. So they check for safety and firearms and who lives in the household and the neighborhood. And then we send her to her own obstetrician for medical clearance. And then we obtain all of her medical records. And if we were working with Dr. Ringler's clinic, he, he would review those medical records and um, either approve or not approve based on the medical records. That's the first piece of the medical evaluation. The second piece would be the physical examination. So that's all done before a match is made. What happens during this first phase, the matching phase, is that your case manager uh, would be presenting you with profiles of candidates and you can decline for any reason, but eventually you'll find one that you like and then we'll be filling in all the blanks about all the information you need to be able to make an informed decision. And then uh, if you continue to like her and she passes all the screening, then we would arrange a meeting between you and this uh, proposed surrogate and that's the final piece before we get into the next stage, which is the legal and medical stage. So if you have the meeting and you continue to confirm that you want to work with the surrogate, then we confirm the match. And then we go into the second stage. In terms of insurance support, that is something that happens during the, the matching stage. So every surrogate needs to have medical insurance for the pregnancy. M most surrogates have insurance for themselves and their families but not all policies cover surrogate pregnancy. If she has a policy that will not cover a surrogate pregnancy, then we have to get insurance for her. And again, that's part of the matching information. So any intended parents can decline and say no, because of budget reasons, we need to wait for someone who has medical insurance because this can add like anywhere from 10 to $25,000 to the bottom line. Or you can say, no, we really like her. We're willing to get insurance because we really want her to be our surrogate. So this is something that you have to decide and we would never force you to get insurance if you didn't want to do that. So that, that again is part of the matching information. And as it says, insurance support, we don't actually procure the insurance. We use insurance brokers to do that. But again, we provide you with really qualified resources to be able to get the insurance in place. And we guide, we guide and help and look at policies with you and help you make decisions. Um, in terms of the bottom row here, some offer legal guidance and escrow management. So obviously um, I would be offering legal guidance. I um, consider myself part of the case management team for any of our parents. So here at Worldwide, you would have a case manager. You would always have me, I would be your legal advisor, even if I wasn't actually doing the legal work uh, because say your surrogate lives in, in Pennsylvania where I'm not licensed or California where I'm not licensed, I would be making sure that you have qualified, competent legal counsel in that state to help you. And I would be monitoring that lawyer's work to make sure the work is getting done. So as the agency lawyer, I'm supervising all of the legal work. The coordination with medical providers, any good reputable agency is going to know how to coordinate with the medical clinic. It's something that we do day in and day out, sending medical records for the doctor to review, making sure the surrogate gets there for her appointments, knowing who the team is at the medical clinic. So we're constantly in, in contact with each other. What I like to think of is that we become one team. The medical clinic that the parents choose, together with the surrogacy agency that they choose, become one team, a group of professionals that are helping you and your surrogate through this really important and intimate endeavor of bringing a baby into the world, your baby. So that, that, that's without a doubt something that's going to happen. And again, any, any good team will be able to handle that very well. Uh, the, I think, uh, Brian, can we go to the next slide now? Because sure. I think there's some overlap and I'm just going to see what's on that slide. Sure. Well, we talked about the egg donation process. Either the medical clinic or the surrogacy agency or both will help you in um, 
finding you resources and good egg donation candidates. And the egg donors um, are screened by the medical clinic. They have to be um, ready medically to be able to be an egg donor. In terms of the legal matters around egg do donation, I can definitely speak to that. You have options. Um, you have an option to have an anonymous donor so you, you don't know each other. And maybe in your contract, you have an ability to contact each other later after a baby's born in case there should be some kind of medical information exchanged. Or you can have an open or a known donor. And that is when you actually know each other's identities and you may contact each other and keep in touch. So that's something to, to think about in terms of what would work for your family and what would be a preference for you. Many people do want the option to be able to contact the donor for their child or children to be able to meet the donor. Um, the, um, the optimal characteristics of an egg donor, that's a personal choice that you have to make uh, along with the optimal medical criteria. And that would be something that you would look at with your doctor. The surrogate, so we find surrogates from all over the United States. Uh, our births only occur in the United States. Of course, it has to be a surrogacy friendly state. There are many and uh, there continue to be more. New York just changed the, their law this year. So that is now a good state for surrogacy. We talked about um, the screening of the surrogate. Let's talk about matching time a little bit. It, it definitely, um, there is definitely a demand for surrogates. Surrogacy is getting more and more popular in the United States. Um, same sex marriage and um, infertility options for um, straight couples make surrogacy um, a widely sought way to have a baby if necessary. And also people from all over the world are coming to the United States to have babies through surrogacy. Unfortunately, in the US it's expensive. However, it is really the best place to have a baby through surrogacy for a few reasons. One, uh, the medical technology advances are uh, premier. So the safety of the medical process is, is something sought after. The legal safety is something sought after, that here in the United States, we can have surrogacy agreements enforced by courts, that we can make sure that parents are named, clearly named, definitely named as the legal parents of their baby before the birth. So there's no question at the hospital that you're the parents. The baby is born, put in your arms, you have the rights and the obligations to begin parenting that baby immediately upon birth. And then the ethical framework in the United States is actually also premier. So here in the US, uh, people, uh, in both intended parents and surrogates are treated with respect and dignity and they have choices. And there's a lot of care that goes into the matchmaking and the support of people throughout the process. So surrogates have choices. Um, uh, they live at home, they have choices for their um, medical care, they have choices of who they're going to match with, and parents have choices of who they're going to match with. And people get to know each other, like differently from like, let's say India, where uh, parents and surrogate never even meet. And so you don't know who's carrying the baby, you don't know what kind of medical care is going on. And of course, there's this um, issue of the exploitation of people in other countries when it comes to surrogacy, which is really what gives surrogacy a kind of a, a tainted name throughout the world. That's why it's taboo in many countries because of this issue. But here in the US, it's not done that way. And we are creating a very wonderful ethical framework for surrogacy that's working really well for people, despite the cost. Uh, so the matching is a very careful approach to who you would like to have as a surrogate who will work for you and who the surrogate would like to have as parents. Things like if there's a birth defect and, and the parents would like to terminate the pregnancy, we of course have to match uh, the parents with a surrogate who's willing to do that. The COVID vaccine has been a big issue. Uh, now it's um, more well understood that the vaccine is a good thing for pregnant women or people thinking of becoming pregnant. 
However, uh, as we were getting uh, into the vaccine months, there were a lot of questions, should pregnant women get a vaccine? And there were parents who wanted the surrogate to get a vaccine and parents who didn't want a surrogate to get a vaccine. And then there were surrogates who wanted to get the vaccine and surrogates who didn't want to get the vaccine. So again, the right professional team is going to make sure that everybody's on the same page with that. So there's not gonna be a, an issue when there's a pregnancy. It's like, we, we want you to get the vaccine. No, I don't wanna get the vaccine. We already know um, what the parties want. We've already addressed that in the matching stage. Uh, other things, ideal characteristics of a surrogate, well, I mean, obviously the bells and whistles of, of health and um, stability and enthusiasm to become a surrogate and dedication and the knowledge that she's carrying someone else's baby. So that commitment to caring for this um, tiny embryo through creating an actual baby knowing that she's doing this for you. And that is well covered through what the clinic does in terms of screening the surrogate, through what the agency does, through what the psychologist does, so, so that you, the intended parents, are protected. And also so that the surrogate's protected because if, if she's not clear on what she's doing, that's not good for her either. Uh, is there another slide, Brian, or uh, no. should I? I think okay. That's uh, it. Yeah. All right. So, um, how how are we doing on time? Should I speak briefly about cost? Uh, sure. Why don't you do that now, please? Okay. So, just briefly, I think one of Brian's um, one of Gays with Kids um, slides had uh, something like one hundred thirty five thousand to two hundred thousand dollars. That's a big range, but it's probably pretty accurate. Maybe one hundred thirty five is on the low side. Maybe one hundred fifty would be um, more accurate for a lower end. Um, on the um, on the surrogacy side, we have to be thinking of about 110,000 to 120,000. The four big things that go into that. There's a lot of smaller things that go into it. Again, any good agency should be able to give you really clear documentation on what things cost and why. And the same with the clinic, they're going to give you very good um, outlines of what things cost and why. The four big things that go into the uh, so on the surrogacy side, the surrogate compensation is the biggest. There, um, people are exposed to about fifty to sixty thousand dollars. It's all broken down, very detailed, in a gestational surrogacy agreement. Um, agency fees range from um, you know twenty-five thousand to thirty-five thousand dollars. Here at Worldwide, it's twenty-eight thousand. Um, we only ask people to pay the first half up front and then nothing later until they're matched. Um, and then um, legal fees, about 10,000 altogether. And the reason for the range um, would be medical insurance. And again, the parents have the ability to um, choose medical insurance and decide on a surrogate who either has medical insurance or doesn't. Uh, so you are the, your agency will get to know you very well and what you need and want in the surrogacy journey. They also get to know very well their surrogates, so that um, when making the match, it's a it's a good it's a good match and it's a, a happy match. And that's the goal for all of us. The goal is for you to enjoy having a baby, for us to take the edge off and make it happen. The medical details, the IVF, the matching with the surrogate. We take that on. You enjoy having a baby. Awesome. Thank you so much, Vicki. Appreciate that. That again, a very thorough uh, understanding of, of working with, an, uh, with a surrogacy agency. Um, we're going to take some cute questions, and we've already got several already. But before we do, uh, as Vicki said, this is a great first step. And I know for all of you, this is a very exciting time. Again, I've, I've gone through it, and I know exactly what you're what you're facing right now. Um, and uh, I hope that you've got a great understanding, broadly speaking, of how surrogacy and IVF works. Uh, in terms of next steps, here's what I would say, is keep doing your research. I'm gonna put in the chat section uh, several links for you, including a link to what we call our curriculum or our guide to surrogacy, which breaks it down into various chapters. Um, we'll also, number two, I would say, set up a free consult. Both Dr. Ringler and Vicki are available for private one-on-one 30-minute consultations. We can really go deeper into questions that you have. We've got other partners to fatherhood. Feel free to reach out to them. 
um, attend more webinars like this. Gays with Kids has some. Again, in the chat section, I'm going to send you links right now. Uh, let me just get that off. The... Um, so again, sent you several links on the chat section. Please look those over. I think they're great next steps. I'm now going to stop sharing my screen so that uh, we can all be visible at the same time. Um, I've got several questions. I think Dr. Ringler, the first one is from you. It was someone when you were going through the process of screening, wants to know the potential risk with PGD, PGT, and is that an encouraged test? Could you talk more about that, please? Uh, yeah, PGT, uh, Embryobobs with PGT has been around for over 10 years now, and uh, technology is getting more accurate, uh, results, uh, technology is more sensitive, and the experience of the embryologist has increased dramatically over those 10 years so that um, studies have really shown minimal to no damage to the embryos through the process. Um, we have to, we biopsy embryos and freeze them. Freezing and thawing of embryos survival rates 99%. Um, so it's rare for an embryo not to survive the freeze-thaw process. Um, but PGT is optional because the egg donors are young. They're in their 20s. And the majority of those embryos will be normal, so you don't have to biopsy them. Uh, but many of our patients want to screen out those that are abnormal, and many many individuals want to know the gender for their family planning. Great, thank you. Um, a question, um, I guess, probably for both of you, uh, that came up before is advice for people who are not U.S. residents. Now, I know we've got someone specifically wants to know how does this all work for a Canadian and then someone else who's actually living in Europe. So could you guys care to talk about that? I'll just jump in. Um, from my point of view, we would want our international parents to have a home country lawyer to be able to get advice on what they need to do to um, obtain citizenship for their baby in their home country. We work with many, many international parents from Canada, from Europe, but, but, but we still would like uh, to make sure that there's a home country lawyer to give, be giving us advice on what they need in terms of a surrogate and a birth certificate and things like that. Great, thanks, Vicki. Yeah, we see patients from around the world too. It doesn't matter if you're you know, East Coast, West Coast, London, Beijing, Tokyo. Um, we help gay men uh, build families. And Vicki brought up something earlier that was very important, communication. So it doesn't matter where in the world you live. You know, we have um, easy, constant communication between ourselves and the attended parents, between the surrogacy agency. We really do all function as a team. Uh, the surrogacy agent st staff, myself and my staff, um, and communication is important um, because during the treatment process, we want our attended dads to be really well informed. What happens, what, what I see today on the ultrasound of the egg donor, what happens next? So you. You will be with us every step of the way, even though you're maybe on the other side of the world. Great. Another question is, who will be my main points of contact, both at the IVF clinic and at the surrogacy agency? So, Dr. Ringler? So each, each of our new patients is assigned a nurse, and the nurse will give them constant communication at each step of the way. Um, I'm always available by email, by Zoom appointment. Um, so I welcome questions from my patients. Um, I'm very involved in my patients. In our program, each doctor monitors his or her own patients th through the treatment process. We don't have ultrasound technicians. So if I'm your doctor, I will do every ultrasound on your patient. I will examine your, on, on your egg donor. I will examine your surrogate. I will be doing your egg retrieval. I will be doing your embryo transfer. And I will make sure that you're updated at each one of those steps in the process. Hey, thanks, Vicki. So at our agency, you would have a case manager and that would be your point person. But I also stay very involved in every case. And as I said earlier, I would be the legal advisor. So number one, I'd be making sure that all things legal are getting covered and done well. And number two, mm -hmm. I'm the owner of the agency and the lawyer. So I'm always watching things. And if people needed to reach me, they can reach me. And then every surrogate would have a support person. So there's basically three people on the case management team, the case manager, me, and the surrogate support person. Great. 
Thank you. All right, next, there's some question, I guess this is for you, Vicki, more about an egg donor, whether it's closed or what the relationship is like and, and what typically happens to egg donors uh, if it's an open relationship of some sorts, what happens with them after the child is born? Well, we let things happen organically and evolve organically. So there aren't any rules for this. Uh, basically, it's up to the parents. So they, the parents have the control over their child and what their child um, has access to or who they see or who can visit the child. So there wouldn't be any intrusion into the family life um, only if the parents wanted to continue a connection after the child was born. And basically egg donors as well as surrogates are psychologically screened. So they understand this too. And especially egg donors are young and they usually are gonna be going on with their lives and having relationships and their own children as time goes on. So they're gonna be busy people in their lives and, and not be worrying about what you're doing with your child or children. So it's really a personal preference. Do you think you want more access? Do you really wanna know the person? Do you wanna to get to know the person better? Or do you think uh, you'd be more comfortable having more of an anonymous relationship and just getting in contact someday if your child has questions about um, what their origins are? Okay, great, thanks. I see we've gotten a couple of different questions about costs so and financial aid services available. I'll, I'll just let everybody know that there's an organization called Men Having Babies, and I'll, I'll give their URL as well. And they have a gay parents assistance program where they do provide grants, you mm -hmm. have to apply for them, that'll help offset the cost of your, your uh, surrogacy, IV, your IVF journey. They also do work with different IVF clinics who actually, I'll let Dr. Ringler talk more about this, who provide, I, discounted uh, fees, et cetera, Dr. Ringler? Yeah, mem mem uh, members of men having ba babies who um, pay for their membership fee, they get an automatic discount off of our IVF cycle. Uh, we're very conscious of costs because this is a very expensive process. You know, we realize that and um, this is a big decision for you. And we try to keep costs down as much as we can, you know, the, the difficult part is high tech medicine is expensive. You know, the petri dishes are expensive, the culture, media, everything done in the IVF lab um, is, is costly, but we really try to keep control of it. Thanks, Vicki, anything else you want to add about that with costs? Well, I think it should be transparent. I think that um, you should be able to ask questions about costs um, with the surrogacy agency. There should be a very detailed, clear list of anticipated expenses that you can ask questions about or know about. And the answer should be, should be clear to you. Okay, great. Um, this one, I guess, maybe Dr. Ringler first is the question has come up about twins. Uh, someone who would like to have twins. I know you mentioned twins early on in your conversation. Could you talk about, you know, how dangerous is it? How common is it? How, how do people who get twins, you know, how does that usually work? Uh, yeah. How much more does it cost, et cetera? Well, in general, you know, each twin pregnancy is a high risk pregnancy because most pregnancy complications occur more often in a twin pregnancy. The big one being preterm labor and delivery. So term pregnancy is 37 to 40 weeks. And most twins are born about a month early, so 34 to 37 weeks. And the goal of the twin pregnancy is to get beyond 34 weeks. Um, because if the babies are born prior to 34 weeks, they're likely to spend some time in the neonatal intensive care unit. And that um, exposes them to um, risk of long-term health consequences, um, huge medical bills. Um, so it's, you know, we try to avoid that as much as possible. So the tough question, you know, what percent of twin pregnancies end up being part, born prior to 34 weeks? Probably in the 10, maybe 15% range. So it's not 80%, but it's not 1% either. Um, so, so we work really hard in surrogate selection for individuals who are planning to have a twin pregnancy um, to try as best we can to minimize that risk. Um, it's always safest for babies to be born one at a time. 
It's just plain and simple. The uterus is meant to hold one baby. Um, so I have more and more patients who want two babies at the same time, electing to use two surrogates. Um, that way they can avoid the, the risk uh, of a twin pregnancy. And I'm seeing more and more surrogates um, declining to do a double embryo transfer because um, they don't want to be put at bed rest starting at eight months. You know, they don't want, they, they want to protect their health as well and their increased risk to them of a twin pregnancy. Um, um, insulin requiring um, diabetes in pregnancy, hypertension in pregnancy. Um, so it's, it's we, we try to minimize risk for everyone, the babies and for the mothers. Okay, thank you. Um, Vicki, the cost of surrogacy that we you went over, does that include all medical costs of delivery, including time spent in the NICU, if necessary? No, it would not be covering the newborn um, expenses in the <clears throat> NICU. That is really something that needs to be addressed. And that, that really ties into the twin discussion. Uh, so um, the surrogate's medical insurance will not cover the newborn baby. So every parent must have insurance for uh, their newborn baby. And especially important for international parents because it's not likely that they already have insurance in the US. So one serious financial concern in terms of trying to have twins would be the newborn care costs. Uh, in my experience, I think almost all twins, maybe with the exception of few that I can think of, are born premature. Sometimes they, most of the time they do fine, but they do spend two weeks, three weeks in the NICU and they get well and help and grow and they come out of the NICU. However, the NICU cost for each baby is going to be approximately $10,000 a day. So there must be insurance for the newborns in any event, single or twin pregnancy, but especially with a twin pregnancy. In terms of twins, the, the, um, there is definitely a trend in, in surrogacy toward single embryo transfers because the doctors like Dr. Ringler expressed are, are, are saying more about this risk and how the human body is meant to carry one baby. But there are still people who wish to try to have twins and it's not, um, it's not completely impossible to do that, assuming that you're knowing the risks and that you can find a surrogate that's willing to carry twins. So there are fewer surrogates willing to do that because of the trend in surrogacy towards single embryo transfer. So it could affect the matching time and um, well, it, it can affect the matching time, it can affect the cost and the newborn care costs must be addressed. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next question actually is for me, uh, someone wants to know, um, has gone through this process, how do you feel questions from your children regarding their origin that are age appropriate and do I ever get uncomfortable questions that leave me feeling concerned? Um, so this is a great, great question. So uh, yes, we, we have told our children, both Levi, who came to us through adoption, and Sadie and Ella, our twins, um, who came to us through surrogacy. They're 10 years old, Levi's 12. Uh, we told them since they were born, they're sort of how we came to be um, a family story. And I'll be happy to share links to both of those blog, blog posts that my husband actually wrote. Uh, they're really short, but yes, essentially we've been telling them since day one, in very age appropriate terms, how our family was created in very loving terms. Uh, do I, so I've never had to feel questions from the kids that are strange. Have I had to feel questions from random people, typically strangers, quite frankly, every now and then someone you meet at the school playground, a parent, absolutely. In fact, um, we created a, a cute video called things people ask gay dads, just to share some of the outrageous questions that people ask. I mean, one of the things that I've been asked is how much did it, how much did my kids cost? Um, who's, who's the mom? Who's the dad? So a host of those anyway. So we, we create a lighthearted video to respond to those. You know, if people ask you inappropriate questions, you can just let them know this is an inappropriate question. And it's not something I'm, I'm interested in discussing with you. As a, as a stranger or as my family member, et cetera. Um, we have come to one o'clock right now. I wanna thank you all for joining us. Again, very exciting time for you. 
We wish you luck. I hope that you'll continue to keep Gays with Kids as part of your journey. We want, we want to be there to help you and make things as smooth as possible for you. I have included links also to both Worldwide Surrogacy and California Fertility Partners uh, pages within Gays with Kids to give you more information on Dr. Ringler and his team, on Vicki and her team, what it's like to work with them, uh, experiences that other, other folks have had who've worked with them. Um, I've also just sent you a link uh, on the chat to the Men Having Babies Financial Assistance Program. Uh, I know there were several people who were interested in that. So Dr. Ringler, Vicki Ferrara, thank you both so much. Really appreciate always your, your passion and enthusiasm for working with us and being available. If anyone wants to meet with you guys, please go ahead and do that. Do you guys have any closing uh, remarks that you'd like to uh, add now? I just want to say thank you to everyone for attending and thank you, um, Brian and Gaze with Kids and thank you, Dr. Ringler. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, Brian and Vicki. Yeah, no, it's fun to come together. Uh, you know, I love to talk about the process and you know, I love to help men have babies. And so if anyone has any questions, you can email me directly or go through Gaze with Kids and um, we want to make sure all your questions get answered. All right. Thank you, everybody. Have a great rest of your day. <laughs>